Thank you, Prabuddha Bharat, convener, and the entire organization to invite me over. I hope I'm audible. Can the audience come up and share what Prabuddha means? Can, can all of you all say that together? What does that mean? Louder, please. Yeah, louder, please. Awakened. Are you all awakened after your lunch? Awesome. Super. So you see, uh, today's session is about uh, uh, technology. And uh, it was very profound to hear the speakers ever since morning, especially when there was a context created for dharma, artha, kama, and moksha. And uh, I was just in intrigued to figure out how you are able to bring dharma and artha together through yantra nirmana vidya, which is primarily technology, right? And if we can bring technology to connect the social and the economic fabric of India, that's really where we are able to solve problems at population scale. So Yantra Nirmana Vidya is absolutely essential if you want to solve for India and for the globe. Because you see, as Bharat Vasis, we don't take, take pride in solving for our own country and our own people, but we believe in this concept of uh, Vasudeva Kutumbakam. So for us, world is the platform and we need to solve for world. And if we are able to bring technology together in a way that can solve for the whole world, we would have solved for kama, which in my own definition is an expectation of the moksha that you need to be able to deliver into people, which primarily is about taking people away from malnutrition, poverty, and bring to them financial inclusion and better health. So that is really what we want to talk about today and figure out a way for India to be able to lead this for the whole world. So that is the subject that I've been given to talk about for how can technology be liberated leverage for well-being of our countrymen, of, of, of Bharat Vasis, and, uh, you know, figure out a way to be able to be the leaders for the whole globe that are looking up to us to come up with something very, very delightful. Now, there are many things that technology can solve for at population scale. It's not limited to financial inclusion alone. If you really look at technology, it cuts across a lot, of, a lot of domains. Let me just give you an example of how I think about technology. See, we all at some point would have taken some medicine, and let's just assume we are talking about paracetamol here to help you control your fever. Now the dose paracetamol is just one common dose, irrespective of my height, gait, weight, right? And, and, and it's just administered to people. How would it be if technology was brought in in the context of pharmaceutical companies where you are able to dispense the right dose given the fact that I have got a different body type relative to any of you all here, right? So technology is going to be a phenomenal, uh, you know, denominator problem solving, uh, you know, end state that I think we need to think about even, even further and I do believe that we have a lot of facilitators as teachers here, and we have a lot of students, all of you all sitting in the audience, and I'd like to invite you over to participate today along with me and play the game, not just be there as, as audience, listening to everything that we preach standing here, but truly figure a way out to be able to participate and play the game of high stakes. Because if we play the game of high stakes, all of us are in it together to make Bharat proud. And that's when India will truly be awakened in the context of Prabuddha Bharat today. Yeah? So let's talk about this in a slightly different context. Highways is what it is to US. Right? For UK, it's about railways. They are the ones who started that off much, much earlier. Cyber security is something, Israel comes up to your mind the moment you talk about cyber security. Right? When you talk about hardware, which is the country that comes up to your mind? Sorry? China, Taiwan, 
Germany. What about software? India, right? I think we have the ability because we've been able to prove in certain pockets that we are who we are and we need to establish ourselves as a country that is able to export software and truly become soft power of this globe. So I'd like you all to participate along with me to be able to play this game of high stakes where we are able to go back and reclaim our position of what we were before the colonial era and before all of those people who ruled us, due to which we've been able to completely forget and we speak in a very different language today. And what technology can do for you is to build certain protocols that will ensure that we speak a common language. You understand what protocol means? I'll explain that to you. Protocol is about taking away the different languages we speak so that we are able to connect to each other without the need for either a translation or a transliteration. And there are technologies that are available to do that, but they speak machine language, right? So machine language, artificial intelligence, you would have heard of all of these buzzwords, right? These buzzwords primarily is all about creating a common language through which we are able to connect via machines. And human beings should be left to look at doing something even more creative, right? Because what you can do as a human being, no machines can do. Creativity, trust, Right? These are the, the cornerstones of being the being in the human. No machine can do that. All that machines can do is to keep doing something more efficiently in the context of repeatability and reproducibility of various things that we expect uh, you know, technology can deliver. I'll talk about some of my experiences in the context of technology. Way back when Aadhaar happened, I was in touch with the founding team there. And there was a lot of skepticism for whether there is something called an identity program that you can run for India uh, through biometrics and iris, right? Capturing all of that and creating a unique identity. There was a lot of skepticism, but there was also a lot of confidence that we will make it happen, right? And then there was this small team that came together along with the government of India. And it was a perfect, harmonious, public-private participation where the best brain didn't drain, but actually came back to India to create it, right? So these were people who were thinkers. And if there is one thing that we should take away from what Aadhaar has done for India is never outsource your thinking. Never talk about having to create a context which is outside the box. Thinking has to be inherently ours. Thinking is something that we can never ever outsource. And if all of us here in this, in, in this auditorium can step back, reflect, think, I think we'll, out, we'll be able to make things happen. So let me go back to the Aadhaar story. When Aadhaar started to become something that people would leverage for opening up bank accounts, you know, getting their ration cards, getting a passport done and many things else, right, including getting a geo SIM card by just putting a fingerprint twice over and getting an active SIM card, suddenly it just emerged that there are many more stacks that you could build one on top of the other to be able to help financial inclusion, health and so on and so forth. And technology came up not as a surprise but as an enabler for a group of people and I had the privilege of working and I was absolutely honored to be a part of such intelligent people who came together to build it for India. So uh, this story dates back about five or six years back when all of us came together and we said that look, many of us who have come from overseas will not put money in charity, but step back and figure out if we are able to bring our respective expertise and experience and put our effort as volunteers without pay, greed or glory and truly become jihadis, digital jihadis for India, right? So that was the commitment that we had taken, some of us together, and we truly wanted to be sevaks, rashtriya sevaks, people who would come together to make India happen all over again. At the denominator level, Aadhaar was a success. We then moved on to create certain financial inclusion stacks that include UPI. Has anyone not used UPI here? You may just put your hands up or just say no and say it as loud as possible. It does look like everybody has used UPI here. So let me ask you another question. What is the UPI that you all use? Do you all use Google Pay? Phone Pay and Google Pay? Beam as well. I'm really happy that someone, you know, talked about Beam. 
But you see, if you really take Google Pay and maybe Phone Pay, right, they capture almost about 80% of all the transactions that happen in India. And where are the transactions coming from? They are primarily coming from people who never could get a debit card or a credit card. These are people who served coffee this morning in the hotel that I stayed in last night and this morning and people who drove me here. These are the people who are primarily using. But let's just step back and think about this in the context of the old colonial world, right? With Google Pay coming into India and supporting a number of transactions, aren't these the same companies that came to India as East India Company as traders several years back? Isn't it? They all came to India by trade. And that is what worries me today. There is data colonization that is happening in India and we need to be very, very careful. Right? And it is this team and the people sitting here, the teachers, the students and the industrialists and all of the intelligentsia, the diaspora sitting here that need to come together and make sure that we take a step back, think hard and experiment. And when we start to think about experimentation, we should never fear failure. In India, unfortunately, when something fails, we consider us to be a failure. In the US and Silicon Valley, if something fails, people come back saying that I become wise, right? And they assume that when you start to experiment, failure is inherently a part of that experimentation program. The reason I implore all of you to think about doing something for India is because if you did it right in India, believe me you, it can be very, very easily exported, right? Last week I was, Perhaps, yeah, the last week I was in Africa. I was talking about the African market and figuring out if there is a way we can export India products, specifically the UPI and many things else that we've been able to create. And I can promise you that, you know, all these central governments, the, the, the Reserve Bank of Equivalent, equivalent uh, out there, the central banks, the banks, everybody is so excited about importing what we've done in India because they have similar problems as that of poverty, malnutrition, health related issues, you know, and, and the underserved in the financial inclusion area. So, so lots of mixed messages here, but broadly what I wanted to do was to be able to share that technology is a phenomenal leveler and it caters to a diverse audience. Aadhaar as an identity is no different than what I have versus what you have and what perhaps some of the industri industrialists and who's who have. It's a denominator. It has been able to solve at a denominator level, right? So what is now coming up very important is this context of digital infrastructures. Digital infrastructures that can come up together to solve for India's scale. What do I mean by that? We've seen physical infrastructures by way of roads, bridges, <coughs> ports, and so on and so forth. Digital infrastructure is something which is slightly away. We need to be able to create it because here we are talking about everything that is getting digitized. Something that you can't see, but something that needs to allow for scale to happen, right? Digital infrastructure is also called out as platforms on top of which a number of applications can come up, right? I'm not sure if I'm making sense to the entire audience here. I'm trying to be as simple as possible because I try to live this on a daily basis. So it just comes inherently for me. But I'll try to simplify this for the audience. So let me try to anecdotally explain this. When you switch the light or the fan off, do you ever think that there is something that powers it naturally? Perhaps not, right? It is electricity that switches your lights and your fans on when you put it. You don't even consider that there is something that powers all of this. Digital infrastructure is something like that. If you are, you know, what you think of as application, what you think of as a consumer is about what is it that I'm able to solve for? Am I able to solve for faster payments? Am I able to make a transaction happen through say a, a U, UPI type application? Am I able to get lending on the back of an application where I'm able to source unsecured lending from, you know, a lot of banks that keep coming in on an app? Right? But you never think about how digital infrastructure has to come together to solve things at scale. Right? So there is this new context where we need to be able to create digital infrastructure through open standards and open source 
which is made available to solve for micro insurance, micro payments, micro lending at scale, so that the last Bharatvasi also has the ability to seek services at the lowest possible cost. Right? Let me try to get you one more example of how lending will completely inverse itself in India by leveraging technology. Have you all used Make My Trip for buying tickets? Some of you all may have used Make My Trip or Clear Trip, right? What really happens there with Make My Trip or Clear Trip? It's just an application that sits on your mobile phone, but the airline is connected to that application and the airline puts their seats, which is nothing but an inventory. Is that right? Similarly, we are now causing the ability for small businesses and consumers to be able to get loans and have the money into their bank account in less than three minutes. That's really where technology is going. Where the banks, through a marketplace model, put their money in, right, just as how the airline put their inventory in, and you're able to get loans in less than three minutes by ensuring that the entire process of onboarding through to repayment is completely digitized. And by bringing digital intimacy to this whole process called lending, you're making the borrower very powerful and lenders step back and are able to create delightful products for the diversity of India that we need to solve for. Right? So today, I'm hoping, along with the, with the governments and along with our central bank, there comes a time very, very quickly where we are able to fulfill the aspirations of Indians to grow their businesses by being able to get lending in less than three minutes, which is, in contrast, very different today, where I have to fill in umpteen number of forms, I have to be able to prove to the banks to who I am, and unless you don't have a collateral loan, unless you don't have a collateral, it's not very easy for you to get a loan either. Right? So technology has the ability and the power to be able to inverse by making the borrower more powerful and putting this entire context by digitizing this infrastructure that will allow your rates to come down. Think about the consequences of something like this, especially for a person who is selling uh, you know, uh, uh, vegetables right outside. Think about the world that they come from. Right? For them to be able to go to the wholesale market and buy vegetables at bulk that they retail out through the day, they have to necessarily go to a money lender. When they go to a money lender, the money lender is able to give them loans at high rates, sometimes rates as high as about 300%, 200% per annum. Right? How can we bring these people into the formal ecosystem and work also with a money lender so that they are licensed entities and not sitting outside of the Reserve Bank of India as the sectoral regulator. So is there a way we can do something where the entire ecosystem can come together and solve delightfully and make commerce happen for the money lender at acceptable rates, for the banks and non-banks and fintech companies at acceptable rates, right? At the same token, make it delightful and democratize the ability for Bharatwasis to be able to get unsecured lending and are able to retire those loans in quick tenures, small tenures. Today, when you take a loan, it usually is about for a year. You get a loan for a whole year, you get 12 EMIs by when you have to pay. Right? A lot of what we do is all about how we have been able to ape the Western markets. Right? So let's, let me stay in this lending as a, as a use case. Uh, if you really look at the US market, there are very large companies there. And there is this whole class of people who are salaried employees. Right? With a salaried, salaried employee, you know that I would get the payment by the first of the month or the 30th of the, of the month. My pay date is absolutely determined. That's where you had this concept of an EMI coming in. Right? EMI comes in when you know that, that I know when my salary will come and therefore I have the ability to make the repayments to the lender who's given me money to maybe buy a house or buy a car and so on and so forth. But contrasted to India, 65 to 70% of our population are self-employed people, right? And in the context of self-employment, you are not guaranteed that you will get your funds on a prefix day from your customer. The behavior is so diverse that certain times a consumer or a, or a customer or a, or, or a customer of a supplier will pay you in advance, 
He may choose not to pay you. He may pay you in different installments. The behavior is so erratic. And in such a context, if you have an EMI by way of a repayment date to a bank, does that really augur well for the audience that we wish to serve in India? You can't do that, right? So therefore, when you step back and think about what you need to do for Indians, it is very important to be able to persist on the problem statements of, of Indians, right? Very, very inherently important. These are certain things that we are solving for in India. Now let me just take a step back to figure out how we want to solve this entire puzzle. Broadly, there are three key legs that are fundamentally important when you want to solve at scale. First is to work with the government of India, to be able to work with the bureaucracy, to be able to work with the market regulators such as an RBI, and figure out a way where you are able to influence policies that are, that are the right things to do for our country. And one has to be able to take a very pragmatic approach, right, and do that only in the context of what you want to solve for and what you want to solve for passionately, without any vested interests in it, right? That is the first leg of these three. The second is to be able to figure out a way where you are able to create technology architecture, not in the way the Western world has done, but do something that is inherently the right thing to do at scale for India and solve for India-type population problems. The third is to be able to work with an ecosystem. Some of my previous speakers touched upon this context of ecosystem. How do you bring the entire ecosystem together? It's like making a marriage happen in a village. You need to have the entire village to participate, not just cut people out. How can you build collaborative frames where you are able to bring everybody in it, all of the current ecosystem players in it, work with them and build acceptability so that you are able to determine abilities to bring certain supply intervention to manage the demands of some of what India and Indians require. Right? So when you talk about requirement of money, there is no dearth for demand. There is enough demand. Demand intervention is already available. How can you address supply intervention and make those intersections happen at large scale is fundamentally important to the way in which we need to solve for for say, a simple use case such as lending or borrowing. Now, coming back, technology to me is a denominator to solve not just for say, lending as a use case or borrowing as a use case. We have to be able to even solve for certain use cases such as helping Bharatwasi save money. Today what happens? Today you are able to, you know, a, a milkman is able to save some money every day he takes that little cash and he puts that in an earthen pot. He waits for a time when he is able to accumulate enough money to buy a small piece of land or a cattle or a cow or alternatively buy some jewelry. These asset classes are limited only to people in certain affluent segments in A-class metropolitan towns. How can you leverage technology where you are able to allow the person to not only collect payments from their customers through say a UPI kind of a mode, but also are able to help him with certain micro savings products. So, you know, there is this entire opportunity available for us to, you know, solve for insurance, lending, uh, saving products, payments, and so on and so forth in the world of financial inclusion by leveraging technology. So, I'm going to stop short of talking about technology except to leave you with something that India, I believe, is able to export. You'll be surprised, you know, Google in India went up, Sundar Pichai went up to the Senate, the, the, the CEO for Google, he went up to the Senate in US and said that, look, if there is a retail protocol and if you want to solve for retail, look up to the India model, right? So India is now becoming fundamentally the cornerstone of being able to solve for the whole globe, not just for India and Indians alone. So reflect upon technology, you know, embrace technology, step in to be able to deliver world-class technologies, not just for our country and also for the whole world. Don't sit there as audience, come over, participate in this game of high stakes and let's make it happen together. With that, I want to thank you for listening to me. I'll take a step back and perhaps leave some time for questions that you may potentially have. Thank you very much, appreciate your time. 
they are very famous and uh, CEO of um, uh, multi international companies. I have the uh, one question. Shall I proud about them or uh, shall I uh, tell that they are ambassador of the those companies to advertise in India? So because India is the biggest marketing in even uh, in digital uh, finance, I mean money transfer system also. So I have the question like this. Uh, can you please answer? So shall I proud about them or uh, can I tell that, like that uh, they are ambassador of their company? So the question is, should you be proud about them or not? Is that the question? It, just to paraphrase, okay, got that. No, you should be absolutely proud about anybody who does the right thing, right? These are all folks who are working for for-profit organizations. Leave the Indian names aside, right? And they're doing their job. But what we need to think about is not to be a pure play capitalist in your mindset, but bring that socialist angle, right? When you're doing good for people, when you do the right thing for people, when you're able to solve for population at scale, there's absolutely no harm in making money. Going back to your question, anybody who does good and who's been able to transform lives, I think it's the right thing and you should be absolutely proud about them. Let me give you an instance of what Google has done. Google has put together navigation, maps. It's sol solving for so many of us. Don't we all use those maps for free? Don't we use a Gmail account for free, right? There are many of these things that these people have been able to come together and put together. Satya Nadella's, you know, Microsoft, they've been able to provide softwares that has eased our lives. So I think anybody who does the right thing for people, where there is an opportunity for us to leverage, we should always feel absolutely proud about them, right? At the same token, as Indians, as Bharat Vasis, in this auditorium to begin with, we must step back and not think about profiteering as the only, uh, you know, motive. And somebody talked about it beautifully. Our dharma is to be able to solve for Bharat Vasis. If we are able to solve for our country and our countrymen, if they win, you win. Those are mindsets that I think we need to bring in. And the moment you do that, I don't think people are going to take away you, you know, for who you are, right? It will automatically reflect. Today, there is a mind, doubt in your mind because these people are hardcore capitalists. So therefore, you don't know whether you should be proud about them or otherwise. My own personal assessment is be proud about whoever has done the right thing for this entire world. So my question is, uh, I know India has, uh, you know, really gone ahead with the technology, but there is still skeptical about, you know, uh, cyber security. Even in the UPI, I mean, you know, I've read that UPI transition have exceeded the uh, cash withdrawals, but still in some of the cases where, you know, a lot of people are skeptical about using uh, UPI because of the security, and also it also attracts, you know, if certain transaction uh, limit goes over, there is a attraction of the tax and all. How do we still, you know, uh, change that mindset of the people from the technology side? Thank you for your question. Uh, the second part of your question was around discomfort because of tax and so on. Yeah. Is it what you said? Yes. That's ah, okay, right. got that. So, reluctance in using because you're in the, you're, you know, it's, it's no longer, there is nothing called anonymity, unlike cash. These are your two questions. The first part, security, fundamentally important. I think when you try to do anything good, there is always uh, this discomfort that comes up in mass scale applications like UPI, to your point. But if you want to democratize payments, then if you want to take it to the last mile, and if that is what is the destination you choose to go after, there will be many speed breakers and potholes and roadblocks along your path. And these are all certain things that you need to be able to solve for as you go along that path. The idea is not to constraint manage, but to opportunity manage. So if there is a way we are able to choose to go to the destination we choose to go to, and at the same token, solve for challenges along the path, you know, that is something that I would vote for to answer the first part of your question. The second part of your question is today, Look, we are seeing drastic change in behavior. To give you some statistics, uh, if you take the Reserve Bank of India data points, 
Uh, and the Prime Minister mentioned about that just yesterday uh, in the uh, India Infinity Forum. He talked about it. Uh, we do about 5.5 uh, to 6 billion digital transactions in India that includes credit card, debit card transactions and so on and so forth. ATM withdrawals and many such. UPI alone does about 4.25 to 4.5 billion transactions. And this is coming from a class of people who do not have a digital product. Clearly it tells me that I don't think anony anonymity of cash is such a big deal any longer. Right? It's about not having a relevant product for the diversity, width and depth of India, which is what UPI has been able to cause. And these days, given the uh, digital footprint that you leave, anonymity shouldn't be a concern. In fact, uh, you know, your mobile phone right now would tell you exactly where you are and gets you far more data. This is, there is nothing called privacy, considering that you have a smartphone in your hand. So anonymity used to be a problem at some point earlier, but no longer in my view. That's my submission. Trend that is happening in the technological development. So uh, we are uh, seeing that there is an increase in cryptocurrency trading. So I just wanted to know what is your take on cryptocurrency? Technology has got its own impact in the social behavior. I have got a daughter, she's 12 years old. She is hooked on, right? It's sad, but it's happening. And there are certain force major events that add up to this. Online school, having to sit in front of your laptop for hours together. And while you're sitting in front of your laptop, there is this temptation to open up a YouTube, right? And continue to be in it for a long time. It is a definite worry. And I, as a parent, I'm quite uh, terrified about the prospects of what this will do for our future generation. There is no easy answer. But I think more and more, it's not just children alone, but even all of us, right? Even I, I was sitting there and I was just wondering for if I had counted the number of times I picked my phone up to figure out if there was a WhatsApp message. It's becoming too addictive. This is a real problem. So I guess somewhere down the line, I would connect back to certain statements that came from other speakers, especially Madam Arati, where she talks about you know, the need to be able to step back, introspect, meditate, and go back to our own philosophical roots. Is there a way we are able to disconnect from ourselves firstly? Technology is nothing but, you know, you've got a tool in your hand. I think therefore, our culture, our tradition, what our parents and grandparents used to practice, which is to wake up in the morning, you know, freshen yourself up, sit near God and meditate, is something that we are fundamentally forgetting. And if we are able to go back and practice yoga, practice meditation, and encourage the family to do that as well, I'm hopeful that we will leverage technology as an enabler and not necessarily become victims of it. So we need to connect back to the being in the human, and that is what I believe in.